everybody and a very warm welcome to the MPN Voice Virtual Forum from London, although our doctors are actually from Northern Ireland, from Cambridge, um, and uh, Professor Harrison from London, uh, Mary Frances from so Northern Ireland, sorry, and uh, Dr Ewan from Birmingham. Um, it is a real pleasure to welcome you, and I know that we have many new people today. Um, I'm Nona Baker, I'm co-chair of MPN Voice and a patient myself, um, and I would uh, love to welcome everybody. We are so thrilled that we've got people from Ireland, Scotland, Saudi Arabia, California, Virginia, Florida, Toronto, Austria, Michigan, Rome, Perth, Australia, Singapore and New York. Truly amazing from the little tiny organization we were a few years ago. Welcome everybody. Just a few um, housekeeping notes. There's still a chance to uh, submit your questions to the panel. Please use the Q&A box to send your questions at any time during the event. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, unfortunately, we can't answer any questions about your personalized treatment plans, uh, please speak to your consultant. Please use the Q&A box for questions that you would like our panel to answer, not the chat. And another final thing, uh, we would be really grateful if you could fill out our feedback survey. Um, it's, it's really important to us because as we're evolving, uh, we like to meet the patient needs and get um, feedback from you. There's one person I also forgot to mention just now is our patient speaker. Always um, a, a, a top subject patient talk. And that is from Faye McGillin. And thank you very, very much for that. Welcome. Anyway, just quickly, because we haven't got a lot of time. Uh, a lot of you won't know too much about MPN Voice and forgive me forgive the ones that do know, but I just want to give a brief overview. The first thing I would say is if you don't know a lot, please go to our website, www.mpnvoice.org.uk. It's full of useful information and contacts. Basically, we, were, we set up to serve the MPN community, patients and healthcare professionals, and the most important thing was to provide accurate and up-to-date information, which is always medically verified. The way we support our patients and their families is giving them the up-to-date information and including research um, results um, on MPN Voices website. We give online support through Health Unlocked, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, I do a monthly vlog cast with members of the community and the Yezi Young People's um, monthly blog, uh, which, is, which is new and very, very popular. We have CNS-led support uh, groups, buddies, MPM patient one-to-one -one peer support with approved buddies. Um, and that's also, when you're first diagnosed, it's really quite nice to be paired up with somebody who um, has been where you are right now. I just missed out the forums. The exciting thing I forgot to say to you about the forums, we are doing our flagship face-to-face -face patient day in London on the 5th of November. It's an event we do biannually. And so if you can, please try and look out on the website and register for when you can. More information will come. We're also going to Chester, Newcastle and Cardiff. All the details again are on our website. Advocacy, having a global patient voice in decision-making processes is also really important. That includes pharma and government bodies uh, in, in making decisions about the process for drug approval and availability. We have printed information booklets and resources, and uh, we are looking at doing some QR codes. So we've got some ideas in the pipeline for reading the, the information. Printed information is always useful and we will always be able to supply the medical community with the printed information. The other thing that is so important, and I think I'm not alone as a patient, saying 
the research is really important. Wouldn't we all like to know how we got it, why we got it? So funding these research projects is another major, major task we have. Thank you for listening. And I'm now going to hand you over to Professor Harrison as we have a full and very exciting programme this evening. Well, thanks very much, Nona, and thanks to everyone for joining us. It's great to have such a global community and for all of our uh, speakers for volunteering their time today. So we've got quite a packed agenda. I've um, strictly said everyone has 10 minutes to get across their main points and we've got some fantastic speakers. Please hold your questions. We put them in the uh, Q&A box, but we'll be doing a panel Q&A discussion for around half an hour or so um, at the end. And if there are any burning questions, we'll try to answer them afterwards. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Anna Godfrey, who's joining us from Cambridge and is going to talk about how do we make a diagnosis? Thank you, Anna, we can see your slides. Super, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to talk about making a diagnosis and I can move my slides. Um, first of all, we have to understand why patients come to see us in clinic. So we're talking about ET, all of our patients come with a high platelet count. And in more than half of cases, that platelet count has been identified essentially by accident. So a patient will have what we call an incidental finding. The blood count's been done for a different reason, not because they've come to us with a symptom of ET. But patients do have symptoms that could be burning pains in the fingers and toes, what we call microvascular symptoms, or sometimes headaches, particularly migraine type headaches. Quite a few patients will have some constitutional symptoms. So the commonest constitutional symptom is fatigue. In the panel on the right, you can see some quite old data now from a study that showed that if you look at patients who are um, being asked about symptoms during follow-ups so and not necessarily at diagnosis, more than 70% of those patients report some fatigue as well as less commonly symptoms such as sweats, bone pain and itching. And then there is an increased risk of what we call vascular events. So those vascular events might be blood clots, that's thrombosis, or bleeding, which we call hemorrhage. So examples of that might be heart disease, heart attacks, or angina, stroke, or problems with the blood vessels in the limbs. In order to understand diagnosis, we have to know a little bit about the blood. So here's a picture of your blood or somebody's blood, and this is what we call a blood film, and we look at a blood film in all of our patients who come to a haematology clinic. The important blood cells are first of all red blood cells. So these contain hemoglobin, that's the important protein in red blood cells, and that's what we measure as one of the most important parameters in your blood count. Hemoglobin is there to carry oxygen around the body. This is a white blood cell. This is one of several different types of white, white blood cells. One calls, is called a neutrophil and it's there to fight bacterial infection. They're particularly important. And then this tiny one is a platelet and platelets are there to clot the blood if you cut yourself. So ET is a disorder of too many platelets and generally patients come to our clinic because they've been found to have a persistent and unexplained um, increase in their platelet count. Platelets are actually produced by these cells in the bone marrow called megakaryocytes. So that's uh, an example is, is, is the arrow there, this big cell. But um, bone marrow megakaryocytes produce more platelets than usual in other situations apart from ET. So they tend to produce um, too many platelets when they're stressed. Um, and that could be for a range of reasons. So for example, they also produce lots of platelets if there's some infection, if there's inflammation, for example, in some forms of arthritis, um, if the patient's, if, if you're bleeding, or if your iron levels are low, and um, unusually in some other cancers. And some patients have a high platelet count that we don't really think is ET, but we never really understand the reason. So first of all, when we have a patient with a high platelet count, we actually want to work out, is this ET at all? Or is it one of these other conditions, what we call a secondary or reactive thrombocytosis? Also, in order to understand diagnosis, it's important to understand what causes ET. And we know a little bit more about that these days. So within your bone marrow, all of your blood cells ultimately come from what's called a blood stem cell. So these cells are quite rare. They're able to renew themselves to make more blood stem cells. And then importantly, they also give rise to other, other cells that ultimately give rise to the, the mature cells that make it into your blood. So they give rise to these bone marrow progenitors that then give rise to megakaryocytes that make platelets, as well as the what, different types of white cells and red blood cells. So in ET, what goes wrong is a single change sometimes more than one change, in one blood stem cell. And that's what everything else then um, happens after that, because the problems that happen in that stem cell then affect all the other cells that are made 
downstream of that stem cell. So what's that problem? Well, it's some damage to the DNA in one of those blood stem cells. That's what we call a mutation. And then all the cells downstream of that will show altered growth and behavior. And the ultimate um, consequence of that is overproduction of, of some blood cells. So let's talk a little bit about more about this damage to the DNA, this mutation. What does that really mean? So a little bit of biochemistry now. This picture up here is DNA, which is a double helix with these lines between the, the, the backbone of the helix. These lines are called bases, and these are a chemical that can be of four different flavors, A, T, G, and C, and these form a code. This code then translates into the building blocks of proteins within the cell. Proteins are made up of a different code and that translates into the structure of those proteins that allow them to do their normal function. So here's an example of a, a segment of a gene. This is actually the JAK2 gene. This is the normal part of the code and this allows us to make the normal JAK2 gene which has folded into a particular structure. So WT stands for wild type, that means the normal um, structure. In a mutation, there's a change in this code. So you can see here this GTT has changed into GTG. So that's an error in that gene, we call that a mutation. And that will then result in a miscode, which results in a miscoded protein. So there'll be a change in one of those building blocks. That building block has changed from a V to an F. That protein structure will be slightly misfolded and that will result in a change in the function of that protein, which will then affect the function of the cells. So in ET, we know about several different mutations that can all, in slightly different ways, result in quite a similar disease that we clinically describe as ET. So the commonest one is this JAK2B617F mutation that's found in more than half of patients. We also um, know about mutations in the CALAR gene that's found in about 25 to 30 percent of patients, typically different to the ones who have the JAK2 mutation. About 5 to 10 percent of patients have a a mutation in a gene called MIPL. And then the rest, a small number of patients have what we call triple negative ET. And that means that we can't find one of these typical mutations and we're not quite sure what it is that's causing their disease. So to make a diagnosis, the first thing we do is to take your blood cell DNA and look for those mutations that we know cause ET. So we look for mutations in the JAK2, CALAR or MIPL genes. And if we find one of those and you've got a high platelet count, we can be pretty sure you've got a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And sometimes at that point, we suggest a bone marrow biopsy. I'll come on to why that can be helpful. If you don't have one of those three mutations, then we're not quite sure what's going on yet. And we need to then go back and look for those secondary causes that I talked about, infection, inflammation, iron deficiency. If we really think this might be ET, then that would be the stage at which we would very often do a bone marrow biopsy. And we might do some other tests um, that are a little bit more specialised to look at other aspects of your DNA. So let's talk a little bit about bone marrow biopsy. What, what, can that, what can that tell us? So here's a picture of someone having a bone marrow biopsy. This is the back of your hip bone, and this is what bone looks like. So it's got some hard cortical bone on the outside, and then this spongy bone on the inside. So the needle goes in there and we suck out some bone marrow. So we do two types of tests. The aspirate, we take out some liquid bone marrow. And here are some pictures of a bone marrow aspirate. Well, we're trying to look at what the megakaryocytes look like because they're the cells that are very important in making platelets. And we're trying to work out, do these look like ET or do they look like something different? So just to give you an example, this, if you can see my cursor, this megakaryocyte here, is the one that probably looks most normal um, in all of this, um, this picture. If I can show you the ones on the right, which are all from a patient with ET, they're all quite big. And the nucleus, which is where all the DNA is kept, that's the purple bit in the middle, that's generally got lots and lots of folding, particularly this one at the bottom, that's very large with lots and lots of folding. So these would be very typical appearances of ET. And I hope without a degree in hematology, I can convince you that they look quite different to the ones from the patient on the left, that patient also might well have a high platelet count, but the megakaryocytes look very different. So that's what we're trying to look at with the aspirate. We also take a solid piece of bone that's called a trephine biopsy. So that's putting a little core through this chunk here, and that looks different, but it gives us similar and complementary information. So this is a low power view. You can see these little spines of bone, which correspond to what you can see in that cross section. And when we zoom in again with these arrows, we can see all these megakaryocytes, which are large with a very folded nucleus. And again, this patient has ET. Also importantly on the trephine biopsy, we do what's called a reticulin stain, which is shown here. 
And this gives us an idea of the level of what we call fibrosis. We sometimes refer to that as scarring um, in the tissue. And that's important, um, particularly in a patient with ET, we like to see that at the start because many patients with ET will have a very long lifespan and sometimes the disease can change over time. So it gives us an idea of the baseline, what things look like at the start. So to make a diagnosis of ET, we need a high platelet count. If we've then got one of the appropriate mutations, JAK2, CAL, or MIPL, things look, look like ET um, looking at the blood down the microscope, and we don't think it's anything else that could be associated with one of those mutations, then we've got our diagnosis. If we don't have one of those mutations, the JAK2, CAL, or MIPL, then we need to be really sure it's not one of those other causes of the high platelets, such as iron deficiency or infection or inflammation. And in that situation, we definitely would need a bone marrow biopsy to confirm that ET is the diagnosis. And that can be a little bit more challenging to make the diagnosis in that situation because it's a, it's a slightly more subjective um, uh, uh, appearance. Does it matter which mutation we find when we're making a diagnosis? Not at all, really. Um, the overlap with other conditions is slightly different. So, for example, JAK2 mutations are found in PV, CALAR and RIPPLE are not. So the, the alternative diagnosis is slightly different. And then the implications for the risk of future complications can be slightly different. And I think Mary Francis will talk a little bit about that. Do we do any other tests at the point of diagnosis? So we talked a lot about JAK2, CALAR and MIPL. Some patients can have mutations in other genes, so I'll just talk about that briefly in case people are aware of it. And um, this is a study in which we looked at um, over 2000 patients who had some kind of myeloproliferative neoplasm. Uh, more than half of those patients did have ET. And actually ET is a, is a relatively simple disease. So more than half of patients with ET just have their JAK2, CAL, or MIPL, and we don't find any other mutations in any other genes. In this study, we looked at a lot of other genes and patients do sometimes have an extra mutation, but that's true in less than half of patients with ET. If you're someone who doesn't have a mutation in JAK2, CAL or MIPL, it can be really helpful to find one of those mutations because that can be quite helpful information to suggest that there is likely to be an underlying bone marrow problem. It doesn't always mean that, but it, it can suggest that. Um, and then there are some uncommon mutations that can give us some additional information about risk of subsequent complications. But at the moment, we don't tend to test for those routinely because they don't tend to alter the treatment recommendations that, that, we, um, that we recommend up front. So that's my summary. I'm ca cautious of sticking to time, so I'm, I'm going to stop there um, and very helpful to answer any questions at the end. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Anna. Absolutely beautiful. We'll all be testing everybody on megakaryocytes after this. So um, Mary Francis, I think you're the next presenter and you're going to talk, thank you very much on, I can see your slides on prognosis and treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you can hear me okay. So my remit was to talk about prognosis and treatment of ET. So prognosis, always an interesting place to start. What exactly do we mean by this? So I did exactly what we all do to try to get put this into better, uh, better words. I Googled it and came up with a couple of phrases. And I think this is quite important. So prognosis, the likely course of a medical condition, likely, or an opinion based on medical experience of the likely course of a medical condition. My question one is the last bit. It's really what you mean by prognosis, what is going to happen to me? And of course, none of us know what's going to happen to us, but it's really looking at what may happen if you've got a diagnosis of ET. Now, the figure we all quote, and the evidence for this is way back, is that the median survival is 10 to 15 years. So the average survival is a very broad 10 to 15 years. This is probably inaccurate and there's many studies now that suggest that the survival in ET may be no different from the normal age sex match population in other words from the general population but because people with this ET do survive for many years and um, there are issues and people would like to know and of course they can't know the things that do affect survival are what happens to the disease over time um, some people transform to myelofibrosis. A small number of people will transform to uh, uh, some form of acute leukemia, and that tends to have a reduced survival. So it's the events that cause uh, the, to influence the survival. And of course, the question is, what can we do about this? There have been systems 
to try and look at this. And this is what people always want to know. And this is the IPSIT system, which looked at a number of factors and was able to divide patients up into very low, low, intermediate and high risk. And this is actually risk of thrombosis free, free survival. This is the risk of how likely is this patient to get a thrombosis in the ensuing years after diagnosis. And that brings us to, therefore, what should we do about that? Because that is the thing that uh, we can do something about, perhaps. Um, the, uh, but we would really like more information like this. And Jyoti Nangalia and her and Greenfield and colleagues have actually put together a sort of personalized patient prognosis um, where they took 63 variables. Uh, so lots and lots and lots of information about the disease and devised a very complicated computer program and have come up with something where they can give some sort of personal prognosis. So this is putting the features of an individual patient in and then they can say at 15 years there's a 40% chance of survival, there's a 20% chance of uh, or a 20% chance of de death and chronic phase, et cetera, et cetera. But this still causes the problem for everyone because nobody is 20% of anything. What is actually going to happen to me, which is what prognosis is about. Um, but it all come down to the fact that as a patient said to me long ago, when, it was when I was telling her about their disease and the daughter said, well, what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to her? At which point the patient said, don't be silly, dear. She is not God. None of us can see that if what will happen in the future. However, we want to look a, a bit further at this because it guides treatment. And we actually uh, divide patients up initially uh, on a very simple risk stratification where we talk about patients who are low risk, which is those less than uh, um, 60 years who haven't had a clot of any sort and with a plate that count below 1500 and into high risk, the opposite of low risk. And what this is, is low or high risk of having a thromboembolic event. And the idea of this is if that you're high risk, then what more can we do to try to reduce um, the incidence of this? Also in the low risk, but how much is justified? And that takes us into, into treatment. So what treatments do we have? So the first thing we do with everybody, low risk and high risk, is that we suggest that they should get uh, low dose aspirin. Now aspirin stops platelets sticking together and therefore reduces the clotting tendency. And this works well in ET. It comes from data from this ECLAP study, um, which was actually in polycythemia vera. And the patients on aspirin are the black line at the top and the patients on, uh, not on aspirin or placebo are the red line. And you can see that the probability of an event-free survival is higher on aspirin rather than placebo. So this clearly shows that aspirin is useful in reducing the number of clots that appear in all patients with ET, provided they can take aspirin, of course. The diagram on the right shows you another important piece of information. This is a retrospective study. It's looking backwards, but it did actually collect data on patients with JAK2 mutations and CalR mutations. And this threw a, a sort of uh, another spanner in the works, so to speak, of treating patients with low uh, dose aspirin. Because with the JAK2 mutated patients, it, certainly those on low dose aspirin had fewer thrombosis and a few bleeding events. But the patients with CalR mutations, again, no difference in the number of them, whether they were treated or not with venous thrombosis. But unfortunately, uh, the ones with a CalR mutation had much more bleeding events. So this brings into question whether um, giving low dose aspirin is a good idea to low risk patients with um, CalR mutations. I have to say, just because it'll get asked, from my point of view, if the patient's already on aspirin and has a CalR mutation, I leave them on it, but I would not now start a low risk, newly diagnosed patient um, on low dose aspirin. So that's the low risk patients, but what treatments do we do for the high risk patients? So the argument with the high risk patients is that their platelets are associated with the thromboembolic events. And therefore, if you could reduce 
the platelet count, then you would reduce the risk of thromboembolic events or clots. And this, the, the first drug that we consider to do this is hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamide as is now known as in Europe. And the evidence that this is effective comes from this rather old study now uh, from 1995, where they looked at people with ET and gave some of them uh, hydroxycarbamide, some of them control, well, it was effective, it brought the platelet count down. But the thing that was very important was that those on the hydroxycarbamide had only a, had a 3.6% thrombosis-free survival, whereas the controls who didn't get it had a 24% risk of thrombosis. So they had much more clots over time. So this shows that it's really a, a good idea to reduce the platelet counts. And the first drug that came along to do this um, was hydroxycarbamide. Uh, and on the right hand side, the PT1 study, uh, which was done in the UK after this, backed up this because the patients on hydroxycarbamide had certainly a better outcome than those on anegrolide, which then became the second line treatment. So the first line treatment uh, to reduce the platelet count for many years has been hydroxycarbamide. I've put this together because it pulls together some of the, prob the advantages and disadvantages of hydroxycarbamide. So it's an oral drug. I've shown you it's effective and it's generally well tolerated. But there are some issues with this. It is a cytotoxic drug. It does interfere with cell division. And if you're taking that for very long term, and I'm talking 20 or 30 years, that may cause some problems, although that this has not been proven because it's interfering with cell division over many, many years. It's a long going argument as to whether it increases the risk of leukemia in the long term. And um, this is part of the natural history of the disease anyway. But certainly we worry if people are going to be on this for 30 or 40 years, what the effect of that is. It certainly does cause increased secondary skin cancers. But again, even that is difficult. Certainly where I work, you're looking at a population who have lots of problems in the long term with um, solar damage to their skin, and that has to be taken into consideration. And the other thing is, from a treating point of view, it actually reduces all three blood counts, the haemoglobin, the white cells and the platelets. It's only the platelets we really want reduced, so that has to be what, well, not the white cells to some extent, so that has to be uh, watched carefully. But that is the first line treatment, generally well tolerated. Are there any alternatives? Well, the next drug that came along that is useful in this space is interferon. There are several of these, and they have been shown in a number of studies, first of all, to be effective, that people get their platelet counts controlled. Um, and there have been other studies done, which I'll come to in a second. Um, interferon so is useful in that it controls the blood counts. Uh, reduces the number of events. And what also may be very important is that you start to see molecular responses. You start to see the amount of the JAK2 mutation reducing, which may be important in doing something with the disease. There have been other studies done, um, the MPNRC112 study, which was a, a compared interferon to hydroxycarbamide and actually didn't show any difference between the two. She showed that they were both effective. And there are new studies coming with different forms of interferon, uh, ropeg intron, um, which has certainly shown to be been effective so far in polycythemia vera. So interferon is an option. Um, again, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Why use this? Well, it's the big advantage that people like to consider is that it's not, not a cytotoxic. It is a naturally occurring substance. It's the substance you make when you have a bad flu, where you get all sorts of aches and pains, um, which has been sort of harvested and used. So we feel in the very long term that this may be safer. Um, it also, because it's not a cytotoxic, can be used in pregnancy, which none of the other drugs I will talk about can be used. And the big issue coming out is that it may reduce the allele burden of the disease. This idea that in, in the long term, it may actually reduce the, the amount of the clone that is causing the disease. Disadvantages, uh, why not give it to everybody? Well, it has to be given by injection once a week or less frequently. And some people don't like that thought at all. 
but it certainly has a significant side effect profile. I've put people, it can cause depression and certainly thyroid disorders, and many people basically find the side effects intolerable. So that's two drugs. And what I would say is that they are equally effective in controlling essential thrombocythemia. There's a debate to be had um, between patients and clinicians as to which one they should use um, first line. Um, there are a few other options just to finish up. Anegrolide is a drug which came along, was compared in the PT1 trial. Um, and found not as good as hydroxyurea, but it was effective. But this trial actually showed, did a, a big long um, follow-up um, of many patients, thousands of patients across um, Europe, and they found that anegrolide was non-inferior. It was as good as hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamide in this trial. So putting the, the things about um, and, and, and agrolyte, I haven't put it quite advantages and disadvantages, I've put it all together. It is an oral agent. Big advantage of it, this is a drug that actually only reduces the platelet count, so it's quite specific. But again, it has quite a marked side effect profile. A lot of patients can't tolerate it because they get a lot of um, palpitations and things like that. And it does have some cardiotoxicity, so you have to watch. Uh, patients with significant cardiac events probably shouldn't get it. The other big issue is that there is an ongoing debate about whether this drug actually increases the rate of progression to myelofibrosis. That came out in the PT1 trial, although not in this trial that I'm showing you. But you certainly need to, anybody on myelofibrosis, on an agrolide, needs followed up um, and uh, should have bone marrows every few years just to monitor that. So then finally, are there any other options? Well, ruxolitinib uh, seemed like a good idea um, and is very now licensed in the, for a second line in, po in polycythemia vera. But unfortunately, in the MAGIC trial, um, it didn't show any advantage over best available therapy. So that certainly isn't licensed yet, even for second line. Um, and there are another, a, a few other agents which are used in some patients and are some, some useful. So these are all drugs that will certainly increase the risk of leukemia transformation in 10 to 20 years. So they are not ones that you would want to use on a young patient, and we can debate what we mean by a young patient, but they certainly can be very useful in a patient where you cannot use one of the first line agents and where control of the platelet count and the prevention of um, uh, having a stroke or other major event is really the prime issue. So radioactive phosphorus was really good. Um, it was only had to be given by intravenous injection about every one or two years. Unfortunately, certainly in, in Europe or in the UK at the moment, it has not been available for some years. And pipobromin and busulfan are cytotoxic drugs that are very useful in controlling the, the, the platelet count and certainly have some advantage as a third line agent in some patients. I certainly would use quite a lot of busulfan in some elderly patients and it's effective. So just to sum up then, in high risk ET, which is defined above, you should they should all be on aspirin unless they can't tolerate this point I haven't made up to this, it's very important to manage any cardiovascular risk factors and stop smoking. And then cytoreduction, we have hydroxycarbamide, which is the standard first line, long-term risks on certain interferons of various type. It isn't actually licensed, um, but it's widely used. It's an option in pregnancy, uh, if, uh, and um, it is certainly a useful option. An agronide, good drug second line, but monitor the bone marrow. And then we have busulfan, pipobromin, and P32 in patients without a long, uh, long life expectancy. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Francis. So, Faye. Hello. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Faye McGillian, and I've been an ET patient since 2013. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how, uh, what happened to me, uh, how I was diagnosed and what has happened since, um, including the different drugs that I've tried. 
obviously the ones for 18 or any other ones. So it all started with steak and chips. And this is July 2013. And I'd been out for dinner with some girlfriends. And the next day I thought, well, just, you know, I've never had indigestion before, but I really feel like I've got something stuck there. Must, it must have been that steak and chips. So I took some normal indigestion medicine uh, and hoped it would go away, but it didn't go away. So a week later, having tried many, many different things, I went to my GP who prescribed some stomach medicine and ordered some blood tests. I went for the blood tests. I started taking the stomach medicine, which I now know was the placebo effect because it made me feel better about 5%. Um, we'll come on to why, well, we obviously know it wasn't, it, wasn't the, um, it wasn't what was wrong. I went back a week later to get the blood test results and it was a different doctor. And they said, well, there's, there's no real sort of definite indication of anything, but it looks like your liver's kind of struggling a bit. You've probably got an infection in your gallbladder. Here's some antibiotics. Now I want to point out at this point that really at no time were my platelet counts sky high. They were probably the top end of normal or just above, but they were never in the more than 1500 bracket. So I start taking the antibiotics and again, there's no effect whatsoever. And by this point, I'm sleeping, sitting up because this stuck thing, piece of steak, obviously, is still there. And I'm taking painkillers because it's so uncomfortable. I go back to the GP a week later and say, look, these antibiotics haven't worked. I still feel grotty. And they said, OK, well, you've probably got gallstones. Get yourself into hospital and they'll give you some IV antibiotics. I thought, OK, here we go. Take myself off to hospital. I thought I'll be in, a, well, I'll be in 24 hours, have some IV and I'll be at my cousin's wedding in Glasgow by Saturday. No problem. Well, that was Thursday and I didn't come out until the following Thursday. When I was in there, I had various tests and poking and prodding. And actually the test for gallstones, the pokey proddy test was exactly where the problem was. So again, everyone was going down the gallstones route. I was being pumped full of antibiotics. I had a tongue like a newborn kitten and I probably could have been used as a Petri dish. I was so free of any kind of bacteria. I'd had a couple of uh, ultrasounds, but crucially, uh, they hadn't actually looked at any blood flow through my tummy. It comes to Tuesday, I felt grotty all weekend, and I go down for another ultrasound. And this time it's quite a senior lady, and she spends quite a long time with her checkout scanner looking at my tummy. And in the end, she turns to me and she says, well, the reason you've been feeling so awful, Faye, is because you've got a blood clot on your portal vein, on your two veins that go to your spleen and one of the veins that goes to your uh, digestive system. I thought, oh, okay. So I hopped off the bed and she came around the other side of the bed and she put her arm around me and said, we will get this sorted. And it was at that point that I thought, okay, maybe this is a bit more serious than a bit of steak. So I went back upstairs to the ward and handed over my notes at the nurse's station. I said, oh, I've got, apparently I've got all these blood clots everywhere. I'm just off to back to bed. So I went back to bed and then suddenly there is a cast of thousands around my bed. Somebody is taking out the cannula and putting another one in. Someone's taking arterial blood. Someone's shoving anticoagulant in my leg. And then the curtains part and a registrar walks in and says, right, Mrs. McGillian, uh, it's most likely there's, a, mut there's a, a malignancy somewhere in your body. We just haven't found where it is yet. Really? Okay. Well, I thought at that point, I did think this is properly serious now. And to be fair to him, he was technically correct, but his delivery needed work. So then uh, we enter a a period of diagnostic limbo, because we know there's something wrong. We don't know what it is really, and we don't know why it happened, and we don't know what the prognosis is. And so from mid-August to mid-November, 
we were in this position, which was really, really difficult. I mean, that diagnostic limbo, if anyone's ever been in it, and I'm sure lots of people have, is terrifying and worrying and keeps you awake at night and you don't really think of anything else and it's hard on your family, it's hard on your friends and uh, possibly there are some doctors who don't quite appreciate how difficult that is for the patient. Anyway, during this diagnostic limbo time, I was referred to haematology and I had a bone marrow biopsy. Now, my mother said to me, Faye, if you haven't ever got anything nice to say about something, don't say anything at all. So that's where we'll leave bone marrow biopsies. So it gets to November and I go and see the haematologist that's looking after me. And she says, well, I've put the jigsaw together. And she, she worked tirelessly to put this jigsaw together because like I said, my platelets hadn't been that high. Um, and she said, well, you haven't got leukemia. I thought, oh, great, that's brilliant. And then she told me that I did have ET and explained it all uh, and said, I'm going to put you on um, these, uh, these, these drugs, which are a chemotherapy drug. And I thought, oh, what? No. And I said, well, how long will I have to take them for? She said, well, forever. So I went home and I cried and I cried all weekend. Um, and then I cried some more and I raged at my body for letting me down. Uh, but I took my drugs like a good patient and I kept seeing my haematologist. And at one point she said to me, well, um, there's, a, there's a possibility of a trial with Professor Harrison up in London. Would you like to? Yes, please. So that is how I met Prof Harrison. And um, I had then a choice of Pegasus, which is what I'm on now, which is uh, interferon. And it's pegylated, which means it's long lasting. So I only have to take it once every six weeks. This person here on the left is my friend Heather, and she actually administers the dose because as uh, Professor McMullen said, it's an injection. And of course I could do it myself, but Heather's medically trained, so that helps. We always do it on a Friday evening. Um, so the, uh, the and, and I'm really, really lucky because the only real side effect I get with Pegasus, and I know this isn't the same for everybody, there's, as Professor McMullen said, there's a lot of side effects that you can get. The only one that I get is the John Travolta's, which is the Saturday night fever, which really can be um, addressed with a couple of paracetamol and a lie on the sofa. And my family realizing that it's been, you know, the night before is the Friday night injection, and then we have the Saturday night fever. So what's happened since? Well, I've been on Pegasus for eight years. Um, and the last time I saw Prof Harrison, she said, well, you've had a hundred doses now. I said, do I get a special badge? She said, no, but I'll continue to take it as long as it's working. Um, and I'm going to finish off with some top tips because I know that there's a lot of new people uh, with us today who might appreciate um, what I found useful when I was first diagnosed. And the first one is give it time. Um, I have to thank Sister Dorothy for that one. Uh, nuns generally are a wise bunch of people and she is. And when I was first diagnosed, she said to me, just, just give it time. And it did take me about a year to get my head around all of what it meant for the rest of my life and what you know was gonna happen and all the medication that I was gonna to have to take. Be kind to yourself. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to change my job and my working patterns, but I would say, look after yourself, be kind to yourself. Um, you know, you, you, you do have this condition now, which is gonna be with you forever. So um, once you've recognized that, then you can move on and carry on. The third one, I guess, is appropriate to everybody. Um, eat well, make sure you drink lots of water, especially if you're on hydroxycarbamide. It made me feel grotty when I didn't drink enough. And exercise, if you can. Leaning on those close to you. Well, they're close to you because they love you, or at least because they like you. So uh, lean on them. 
that's what they're there for. And if you are at an early stage or you need to chat to your team about medication, then make sure you take someone with you um, and get them to bring a paper and pen. Because a lot of the time, I know that when I saw um, the haematologist that told me that I had ET, I heard ET and I didn't hear much else. It went. And lastly, keep up the dialogue with your haematology team. They are there to help you. They are the most reliable source of information. And um, you're going to be seeing them um, a lot for a long time. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Faye. Uh, maybe I should be a bit more sympathetic about 100 injections. <laughs> You don't give them all the time though, do you? It's like once every once every six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Yeah. That was amazing. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank so you. I'm going to hand over to you now, Joe, in Birmingham with the Birmingham Bull. And yeah. thanks for joining us to talk about current research. Here we are. And thank you, Faye, for that. That was, uh, I think if anybody takes anything away from this, it won't be remembering my talk, but remembering that and the story. I think we've got so much that we can learn from actually listening to our patients. So thank you for that. And without any further ado, I'm just going to whiz through basically some of what's going on at the moment with clinical trials in ET specifically. So, and we have to remember that trials are, are uh, critical to answering many, many questions about all aspects of the MPNs and not just finding new drugs, but there's a whole lot of work um, that goes into answering those unanswered questions before that. And so this is um, one of the slides that I use, which um, says basically not all trials are drug trials. And if you have an opportunity to participate in a trial, that might be looking at one of a whole host of things. It might be looking at quality of life. It could be looking at some of the detailed genetics that we've been looking at. And I put this selfie here. So this is my um, little cell taking a little picture of itself because whenever you look at any trial data, um, that looking at specific drugs, you'll find that there's an impossibly complicated picture of a internal innards of a cell. And that's so important that all of this preliminary work is done so that we can um, determine some of the answers to those questions. And then the other type of trial is the epidemiology trial. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that as well. So, so some of the questions that patients have, well, how long have I had this? And these, these trees here are very beautiful, but if, you can imagine if you start at the, the leaves of these trees and you examine them in detail and you work back to where those leaves have come from and down the branches and into the trunks, then you can start to unravel what's happened at the very tip of that branch. And that's what the Sangha Center, the um, uh, Jyoti Nangalia's group there have done, looking at um, the family trees of cells, looking at the mutations that have, have been mentioned today and looking at patients who've got a number of different mutations, but tracking them down those branches to see exactly when those driver and those mutations started. and and. They've shown that um, the start of some of the myeloproliferative um, conditions that we see are really very, very young, almost in utero. So before you're born, you may have a genetic mutation and then you build on that and that gives the diagnosis later on in your life. The other question is, why do I have MPN? So this is the epidemiology side of things. So this is looking at, you know, are there things, are there triggers that we can detect in patients? Um, are there external triggers? Are there family triggers? And so this study, which is being led by Mary Francis McMullen that you've heard from today, and Leslie Anderson is called the Mosaic Study. This is a really critical study. We've already got some pilot data from Belfast and Southampton on this, but um, this is looking at um, patients and then matched controls to see whether we can detect, having looked at many, many, many patients, what the underlying cause is. And in the UK, here you can see um, the UK and Ireland, you can see the um, centres that um, are 
um, open for this. And this will be evaluating all of these things, lifestyle, medical risks, occupation, um, sort of how you grew up, um, as well as looking at genetics and looking at some of the exposures to toxins um, in, say, toenails, um, as well as looking at further quality of life data. So that's the mosaic study, really important and um, is being supported by MPN Voice financially to see whether we um, can, can get that data in quickly and smoothly and see what the causes are. So moving on to treatment, you've heard that really the backbone of our cytoreductive treatments for those patients who need them and who have high risk disease are hydroxycarbamide and interferon. But can we move on from that? Are there um, other options, other um, drugs that may be of use? And so the current clinical trials in ET are looking at these two drugs that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about bomodemstat, probably more than Pelabrasib, and um, so we've got more mature data on that. And um, there's also an alternative interferon that Mary Francis touched upon. So I'll talk about those. But if we start with hydroxycarbamide, this is a different type of study. So this is a, a US study. So this is um, based on the um, SEER data. So the SEER data is basically what we call registry data. So data that looks across pretty much a, a whole country, although it captures a small proportion of, of the US and looks at more than 4,000 patients with MPNs who have either been exposed to hydroxycarbamide or not. Not. And whilst the follow up for this is um, fairly um, short in, in terms where many, many patients say take um, hydroxycarbon maybe for 20, 30 years, um, you can see here that there's actually been shown to be no difference in second malignancies um, in those patients um, on hydroxycarbamide versus those not excluding skin cancers. So as I said, I'm just going to talk about the current novel therapeutic approaches in ET trials and sort of four parts to that. We've got bomodemstat. There's a small amount of data coming from this ROPEG interferon or BESREMI that's um, really being run in the US and in countries other than the UK, but um, the SURPASS ET study. Um, and I'll look a little bit at palabrasib, and then I'll just talk briefly about calreticulin and, and a vaccination approach. So this is bomodemstat. So this is what we call a phase two study. So everybody in this study was exposed to bomodemstat, and then they were um, assessed for their responses. Um, it's done across the world here. So you can see the UK, US, Germany, Italy, Australia, and New Zealand participated in this. And um, the around 60 patients and so far enrollment is ongoing, but we have some baseline data coming through. It is an oral tablet that's taken once daily. And in the trial, that has been for patients who have already had hydroxycarbamide and then are intolerant or resistant to it. And um, the things that are looked at are things like the platelet responses. And the reason that this drug is, is thought to be useful is that if you take this um, cartoon here, you can see the blue cells there. Those are the cells. So you've got the stem cell. That's the very baby cell that gives rise to that megakaryocyte that you saw in Anna Godfrey's talk. And those um, are driven by LSD1. And so an LSD1 inhibitor, which is the way that bomodemstat works, can actually then reduce the malignant cell population, can reduce the growth factors, can reduce the fibroblasts and marrow fibrosis, um, and can also um, lower what are called cytokines, those things that drive the constitutional symptoms like fatigue and anemia. So it seems like a good drug to be looking at to target um, conditions like essential thrombocythemia. So this is um, the way that the study titrated the dose. It pushed the dose up slightly um, each time, depending on the platelet count. And this is the effect it had on platelets. And so you can see that um, in the 32 patients that were treated here in this early data, then 97% um, actually did achieve that platelet count of below 400. And if we look at the other cells, you can see that the white cell count there, that wasn't um, particularly affected. It was brought down a little bit, but still within normal, um, normal range or normal levels. 
and the haemoglobin um, was maintained as well. So it didn't cause anemia. If we look at some of the other data that's coming from this, then there's quite exciting data really here that um, what it may do is actually reduce what's called the allele burden. So that mutant allele frequency, that a math there I've sort of highlighted at the top this direction is from point zero where we start and these are the reductions in that that are seen um, with this fairly short period of time being treated with bomodemostat so um, you can see both Jack 2 and Calara respond symptoms also respond and so you can see here this group of patients here so again this is baseline zero and this group of patients all have an improvement in their symptom score and those patients in the blue bars those are the patients that had a baseline symptom score that was high and so it's those patients with high symptom scores seem to respond particularly to um, having a reduction in their symptoms at this very um, early and interim time point and again if we look here this um Again, this is looking at symptoms, but looking at symptoms that have been pulled out really excitingly. I mean, I think this is the first drug really in ET that we've had where potentially fatigue might be reduced using Bomadem stats. So um, a really uh, exciting and potentially valuable drug there. The main side effect being taste change. Just very briefly, palabresib, this is another one of those internal diagrams of the cell, targets in a different way, but again looks at targeting um, pro-inflammatory cytokines and the megakaryocytes through BET inhibition. And that's being looked at in the manifest study. It's a complicated study that includes myelofibrosis patients in the first three arms, but in arm four, this is high risk ET patients. So we will get some really exciting data on that as well, I think, in the next year or two. I did mention interferon. So this is Besremi or Ropeg interferon. So this is an interferon that has been pegylated and um, only needs to be given once every fortnight. And this is the Surpass ET study that's being run in the States and should hopefully again give exciting um, data on use of Ropeg interferon that's already been shown to be valuable for polycythemia vera. And then finally, I'm just going to touch on a potential novel approach, and this is calreticulin vaccination. Some of you will have a calreticulin mutation. So around um, 25 to 30 percent of ET patients will have a calreticulin rather than a JAK2 mutation. And so what has been found is that these may be a potential target for what's called cancer immune therapy. So using antibodies to target that. And so... Um, in this cartoon here, again, another very complicated cell cartoon, but the little um, dots here, the little um, orange circles are the calreticulin being secreted. And then these little Y-shaped things are antibodies, so they can potentially stick to the calreticulin and drive an immune response with an anti-mutant antibody. And certainly um, that seems to be a reasonable approach. We can certainly see that um, the immune responses can be demonstrated to be increased. Do the work of the Danish, there's also been more recent data that's come from Australia as well. Um, what we don't have yet is any um, sort of evidence that that can be translated into a clinical response, although it may well be that this is a useful approach for diagnostic tool. So just in summary, bomodemstat, pelabresib, ropeg interferon, and the mosaic study are the things to watch out for in the coming year. Thank you for listening. Oh, fantastic, um, Joe. Thank you very much. So we are just going to move quickly now to a very quick section on controversies and actually we'll move then seamlessly into a panel Q&A because um, there have been lots of questions pre-submitted. So I thought we might close this um, section by just briefly answering some questions that frequently come up and that we often as clinicians discuss with um, patients and their families in clinic. And so I've just done some very simple slides. I haven't got any fab slides like 
Faye with steak and <laughs> chips or exploding brains or Jo with all her science and Mary Frances with the different drugs and Anna with all the wonderful pictures of bone marrows and things. So these are just questions and answers. So is ET an answer? Why is this confusing? Yes. And the World Health Organization has designated this disease as a neoplasm. And remembering in the UK, this brings many benefits. You would get access to clinical nurse specialists. We can approve drugs and we can get funding for trials. Can a patient have both ET and PV? And the short answer to that is no. And there's a question that we're going to answer in the Q&A about how can you tell if you've changed from ET to PV? Um, but once you've developed this high red cell count, you've got PV, not both. Frequently asked, must you be seen by a specialist? So I would say not in my opinion, because there are national guidelines and we're a very well connected UK haematology network. We've got clinicians um, from all over the UK here this evening, and uh, we frequently connect with other clinicians and we have a uh, national guidelines, but it can be useful. And your doctors will reach to other colleagues if they're uncertain about diagnosis, there's a difficult decision. You heard Faye was referred, question for a trial. We didn't put you on a trial in the end, but we still allowed, gave yeah. you interferon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any foods or supplements that will keep my platelet count down? Short answer, not in my opinion, but it's best to have a healthy balanced diet. If you want to take supplements, let your team know because some of them can interact. So for example, turmeric interacts with anticoagulants. Why do some patients have both clotting like Faye had and bleeding? So this is a characteristic feature of ET. Some patients have both, some may have more one than the other. And for example, Faye, who I don't, I hope you don't mind if I mention that you're no, on a clot, a yeah, blood yeah. thinning drug. So you have had a clot, but you could get bleeding as a consequence of the blood thinner. Mm -hmm. And there are also some scientific reasons um, behind that as well, um, related to the disease itself. There are several questions that have been submitted in the chat about is one drug treatment better than another? And I'll ask probably Mary Francis to comment on that in our Q&A, but in brief, that our choices are very much individualized. And as you heard from Faye, it is possible to switch mm. from one treatment to the next, although we would discourage you from doing that week to week and month to month. Generally, if you're going to try a drug, you know, try it for a few months. And lastly, is ET inherited? Well, we're looking at epidemiology, and Mary Frances is leading that, and Joe's mentioned it. So inheritance is very rare, but around one in eight, one in 10 patients might have an affected family member, but they're usually more distant relatives, and we would not routinely recommend family screening. So I think I've done 10 minutes of talking in two minutes, and I think at this point, ah, oh, I missed the most important one probably. Do all patients ultimately progress? Well, I think we've shown some data suggesting that no, the majority do not, but I know that's a big worry for patients and we know that from um, international surveys. So I would still say the majority do not, and we'll probably have some discussion about that. So now we will move to panel Q and A. So I'm gonna ask my colleagues, please to kindly turn your cameras on don't leave me here on my own with Faye just to answer all these questions <laughs> um, we've got two questions um, in the chat and one of them is actually about interferon and covid so maybe we can um, wrap that up and ask a general question about covid and mpns and continuing need to shield should our patients with ET be still avoiding public transport, et cetera? Um, Anna, do you want to comment on that maybe? I can tell you what we're telling our patients at the moment. So um, I think a little way back in the pandemic, there certainly was some concern around patients with MPNs. Um, we had some evidence that there was a higher risk of patients having severe COVID and that was particularly patients on um, certain therapies 
such as ruxolitinib, which we wouldn't expect many patients with ET to be on, although there will be a, um, just a few. Um, I think these days, I think the most important thing that we would encourage patients to be up to date with is vaccination. Um, and uh, so what we generally say to people here is if you've had your vaccinations, then um, we encourage people to, to, be, to, to, to live as normal a life as possible, but understanding that people have um, their own approaches to risk. So you may prefer to avoid crowded public places, you may prefer to wear a mask, um, and that's entirely, you know, that's, that's entirely understandable, but it, there are other benefits of being out and about to, to mental health, to getting exercise, um, but yeah, keep, keep your vaccinations up to date. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Mary Francis, question for you. Um, why is interferon not considered the, in inverted commas, gold standard treatment, considering its reduced risk compared to hydroxycarbamide? And then a follow-up question to do with PV. I know we're talking about ET today, but what do you do if roxolitinib stops working? So, Let's take the first question about interferon versus hydroxycarbamide. Yeah, so this is an interesting and evolving issue. Um, and I tried to sort of put the word advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, I mean, I think it, the big issue is, of course, that interferon is not licensed for the treatment of, of uh, ET. So although that, yes, you could argue neither is hydroxycarbamide. Um, the, uh, I think it's, it's an issue. They're, they're both shown to be equally effective. Um, and it really comes to this long term, and um, I would put very long term issue about whether the, the, uh, there are risks with hydroxycarbamide long term. It's interesting, we originally wrote the PV guidelines. Uh, way back, we said under 40, we would give an interferon first line above 40, and um, we would go for hydroxycarbamide. When we rewrote those some 10 years later, we said right up, and we wouldn't put, they were both equally effective, and it's a decision, we didn't put an age limit on it. So I think there's no reason to say one rather than the other. And it's really very much a question of what is best for this patient. Certainly, if I was looking at a 50 year old, I would probably be saying you want to go on pegulated, try pegulated interferon first. I don't think that's necessary or advantageous to a 75 year old. So it's a, an, a, an issue for discussion between the patient and the doctor. OK, There's no and right then... answer. Yeah, it's individual, isn't it? And maybe try one and see what you think. Um, and what would you do if ruxolitinib stops working for PV patient? Mary Francis. That's a good question. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen very often, does it? It's more no. about toxicity. Usually yeah. it's infections or skin yeah. cancer. So it's not really like myelofibrosis where they're losing the response. Um, it's whether they can't tolerate it. And I think, I mean, there's nothing else yet in that space, and it will be a long time before um, some of these other agents come down to that space. So I think if, it, if it's not tolerated, which I think is much more likely, you're going to look to think back to the, the other agents. The big advantage of ruxolitinib and PV is that it may be particularly helpful for the symptoms uh, for people who have a lot of problems from a upregulated jack start pathway. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, I'm going to come to you now. Um, there's a question um, which starts, what considerations and advice would you have for those diagnosed with ET in their 20s? I was recently diagnosed with ET and I'm worried about what the future looks like for me. So I'm hoping if you're with us now, you're feeling a lot more informed and a lot more hopeful. Um, and what does pregnancy look like for an ET patient? Thank you, yes, that is a, it is a difficult situation when you've got so far into the distance to look and to look at the different um, things that you 
going to face during your lifetime, but I would say at the very beginning of the diagnosis that it can depend very much on um, your risk and it may have been picked up at a time when you don't really need any significant treatment apart from maybe aspirin. And I have many patients in a similar situation, probably more towards their thirties, but, um, but in that kind of lower age group where, you know, the disease remains really very, very stable over a long period of time. If you do have very high platelets, then, um, you may need some cytoreductive treatment in patients in that situation. I would generally veer towards um, interferon and look at um, getting interferon and getting that into a sort of stable dose. Some patients on interferon actually can have that um, either tapered over time or can actually sometimes come off interferon for a period of time and go into a, a kind of remission um, for, for some time. So it's worth looking at, you know, whether you may have a period of time on interferon and, and then, you know, try coming off that. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, in terms of pregnancy, again, it depends very much on your previous experiences of pregnancies, whether you've had previous miscarriages or problems with pregnancy. But I would say that the majority of my patients who have wanted to um, have pregnancies have had successful and quite normal pregnancies with normal deliveries. Um, but it's really critical, I would say, to be um, in very close contact with your haematologist. Or at that point, it may be worth looking for a specialist and um, a, a haematologist that perhaps liaises with an obstetrician that also knows about um, the potential issues to look for in that scenario during pregnancy. But there's absolutely no reason I would say why a patient couldn't have um, a completely normal and successful pregnancy um, with, with everything in, in the right direction. Well, that's great. Thank you. And um, just one more question, if you wouldn't mind, because often um, it just so happens that it's our young patients and frequently young women, isn't it, that have very high platelet counts. Any tips on very high levels of platelets protecting themselves from bleeding? Yes, I think, I think that is a, again, it's a very difficult scenario, really. And I guess if the platelets are very, very high, then um, or there are bleeding problems. So you can get um, a, a, a paradoxical bleeding um, risk with high, very, very high platelets for a number of reasons. But one of those is that you can sort of almost mop up one of your blood clotting factors called von Willebrand factor. And so having a look at that and looking at what the reasons are for the bleeding, where, where is the bleeding? Often it's menstrual bleeding. That can be a really difficult um, scenario. So um, actually, again, looking at whether hormonal treatment to try and, and prevent that, um, looking at the bleeding versus the blood clotting risk and looking at whether actually it may be worth um, getting some treatment, even if it's fairly low dose treatment to reduce those platelets down, perhaps not to the 400s, but to the 600 sort of level can actually sort of help with those symptoms if you have got very significant bleeding. So I think th those are the things that I would be thinking about, but looking at where, where and why and whether we need to think about bringing the platelet count down. Absolutely great. Thank you very much. So, um, Faye, I'm going to come to you now, okay. actually. Um, I suppose um, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you. One is about symptoms mm -hmm. and how if you, you, if you are able to, separate symptoms that you think might be due to your MPN and symptoms, or well, maybe your Saturday night fevers are <laughs> one obvious thing. And then... Um, I think you already given us some really good top tips for coping with having an MPM, but maybe if you could just talk about the kind of maybe top one or two again, just for okay. the audience. That okay, would be great. So a symptom one first, please. A symptom one first. Actually, where it's really quite tricky sometimes separating out what is MPN and what is just life. Um, obviously. The day after the interferon, that is clearly due to the interferon. Um, and yes, I do get a bit fatigued, but then, you know, doesn't everybody with a, you know, busy, busy life? I'm sure we all do. 
So that is actually quite a tricky one. Um, I know there's every time I go for my appointments, there's a 10 uh, rate out of 10 your symptoms, you know, in the last 24 hours in the last week. And that's really useful, I think, for both the patient and the clinician to really sort of focus and think about it. But yeah, that's quite tricky for me to separate the two. Um, so a lot of the time I just blame it on the drugs and just carry on. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we hand out MPN tens in, in the clinic. Mm. Um, and so they're a way of scoring symptoms. But I think sometimes it's just about having a conversation, isn't it? And yeah. Talking it through. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's a tricky one to answer. Definitely. But, yeah. Um, so I, I think that my point really was. It's tricky for everybody, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So just have the conversation, I think. Um, and then the other one was about, um, yeah, the top tips. So uh, definitely the uh, hydrating, with, particularly with hydroxycarbamide. If I didn't absolutely have a bottle of water clamped to my side when I was on hydroxycarbamide, I would feel grotty. Um, and if you're newly diagnosed, honestly, give it time. Don't push yourself to do anything. It, it will take a while for it to all sink in. Um, but, you know, you'll be OK. It will be it will be OK because, you know, your, t your team will look after you. You keep up the dialogue with them. Um, and yeah, it, it will be OK. PMA, positive mental attitude. Oh, completely. Attitude. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. I should have really summarized, summarized it like that. The, although this glass is empty, it's actually half full. And even if it's not, actually then talking about it and finding yeah. people to talk to is really good. Fantastic. Good. Um, so, um, Anna, I'm going to come to you and ask you some questions here that uh, have been submitted about um, progression. And I might follow up with the question that's been asked by Sharon in the in the Q&A as well. So the first one is what is known about progression from ET to PV and are there any signs other than raised hematocrit? OK, so um, I, I have looked at the literature about this before. It's um, it's. It... <laughs> It's one of those things that can be quite hard to study in the literature. And one of the reasons for that is that a lot of patients are on treatments such as hydroxycarbamide that will tend to lower their hemoglobin and their hematocrit. So we can have a guess by looking at patients and seeing how many of them seem to develop a high hematocrit or hemoglobin over time. But biologically, there actually might be more patients that we don't really see develop PV over time. So some patients, um, we see the hematocrit going up. Um, we describe that as, as developing PV. In some ways that we're more likely to see that if you're not on treatment that would reduce your blood counts. So I think when I looked it up, it was in the region of less than 5%, maybe one to 2%. I think Mary Frances had some figures on her slides. Um, when, when I've looked at it, I've, it sometimes happens quite early in the disease. So there are, do seem to be a group of patients who are diagnosed with ET with a high platelet count but it's actually just the beginning of their disease. So they, they first of all seem to have a high platelet count, but actually fairly soon we see that their red cells are going up. So it's more that it's just the beginning of their disease. And then there's that other group of patients who have had ET for a long time, and then suddenly we'll see the hematocrit go up. So in order to make a diagnosis of PV, we've got to say that the red cells are high, and that is basically a high hematocrit um, high haemoglobin or occasionally we do something called a red cell mass study we don't tend to do those quite so often anymore that's that's how you make the diagnosis have I covered it all Claire was there some more in there yeah absolutely absolutely and sometimes the disease can just change can't it um so here's a question about the other interface which is between ET and myelofibrosis so I'm going to read the question out. It basically says, when a bone marrow biopsy is undertaken at an early stage for an ET Calar patient and shows a small amount of scarring or fibrosis, brackets grade one, is there any evidence to suggest this makes it more likely that the disease will change into myelofibrosis in the future? Okay, so there are... 
I think I had a quick look at this before before the meeting. There are lots of studies that have tried to look at what are the factors that predict whether patients will go on to develop myelofibrosis in the future. I think it's really important to remember that you're an individual and there are lots and lots of factors that have been done on big, big groups of patients um, to try and make these predictions, but it doesn't predict what's going to happen to you as an individual. So um, if you take big groups of patients as a whole, then the more reticulin you have at diagnosis, it slightly increases the chance that, you're, that you'll develop more reticulin in future. But perhaps that's not that surprising in that going from grade one to two in the future is, is going to be a little bit easier if you had one to start with rather than zero. It's also important to say that if you look at the different studies, they all started with slightly different groups of patients. So it can be quite difficult to get consistent messages. So it's not always completely straightforward. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, many, many patients with ET have grade one fibrosis and very much the minority will develop myelofibrosis over time. Okay, that's great. And just sorry, just to on the same theme, what about prolonged high platelet count? So I guess just making that question more into, is there any advantage of treating, even though you're not high risk from the point of view of being over 60 or having had a blood clot, that treatment might reduce the risk of progression to fibrosis? Yeah, so I don't think we have any evidence for that at the moment. So taking the question of does having a high platelet count cause myelofibrosis, I, I don't think we've got any evidence for that. And that's particularly true because there are some patients who don't have a mutation, the patients who don't have JAK2, CALAR and MIPL, sometimes they have very high platelet counts and actually the rate of those patients developing myelofibrosis is very low. So it certainly doesn't seem to be that having a high platelet count necessarily means that you're going to develop the disease in future. At the moment, we don't have any clear evidence that any of our treatments prevent transformation to myelofibrosis. That's what we're aiming for in the future, but I don't think that that as a treatment target is a is a reason to be starting therapy it's much more about preventing bleeding and other other complicated other vascular complications and i think i would say the same is probably true about the question that's come from sharon in the chat you know about early intervention with myelofibrosis that unless there's really an indication to treat early stages of myelofibrosis again there really isn't evidence but if there is an indication to use a drug like roxalitinib or other drugs so if the spleen's getting bigger or there's lots of symptoms then we would treat but otherwise I don't think there's any clear evidence that treating reduces the change in myelofibrosis Do you, would you agree? I think feeling better is a good thing so I think we know that in myelofibrosis, if you've got symptomatic disease, then treating it seems to be a good thing. Um, but outside that context, I don't think we know that there's an advantage. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Mary Frances, can I just ask you to give us your thoughts on early treatment with myelofibrosis? And then I'm going to ask you about epidemiology because you're the expert on that, I think. OK, so early, early treatment, I think Anna said it really, there's no evidence there's lots of studies being done there's not there's now no evidence it's difficult when you see a patient with symptoms with myelofibrosis it's easy and um, you want to give the treatments but we have this debate all the time about somebody who's early when should you start the treatment um, and we're sort of stuck to stick to the guidelines at the moment symptoms splenomegaly um, and there also is an issue about patients starting treating them with myelofibrosis because many of the treatments bring their counts down. Um, and that may be an issue because if you make somebody more anemic than they were, they may feel worse than they were beforehand. Absolutely. So we're trying to answer these questions, aren't we, in clinical trials? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, question for you, um, which is a good one. Any information on environmental effect on MPNs as mm -hmm. certain toxic situations can create an MPN as a result? So I guess that's two questions, isn't it? What about causing, but also I would have in my mind, is there something if I've got an MPN about the environment that might make it worse? Yeah. So the second bit first, I don't know how you're going to get that information. Is there, you know, there's nothing that we know of in the environment. The big issue is the causing and what factors in 
prior to the diagnosis may be associated with the development of an MPN. And that is factors in the environment, occupational factors, things that people do like smoking and all sorts of things like that. Um, and we really actually got into this way back because our colleague in Southampton, where there's a lot of oil refineries and things like that, and toxins thought there may be more a greater incidence of MPN. And there, we looked originally at all that had been published in the literature and analyzed it. And these were a series of very small studies. I talk about we, but actually the epidemiologists that I work with did this and showed that there were certain things had been shown to be associated, certain occupations where they may be more toxins in the environment, etc. But it was very small studies and it was hard to, to, to get any further. So that's why we set up the Mosaic Pilot, which is actually the biggest epidemiology study that's ever been done, even though it was a pilot. And it was trying to look at how you could do a bigger study. But it was big enough to show some results, certain associations with development of an MPN and um, things like um, uh, uh, number of bed children in the bedroom when you were a child, which may, of course, be a reflection of um, deprivation. If there's three children in the bedroom, it's likely to be other factors associated with that. CT scan, more CT scans, but that's very hard to, to um, sort out because people have CT scans for all sorts of reasons and how they're done and the amount of radiation is all changed. So that's why we're now doing Mosaic, which will involve thousands of patients and controls. And it will look at, well, it's got, it's, it's, half recruited as we as we go um, and they to look at patients something that patients don't quite like but we want ones that are relatively recently diagnosed because that gives you a cleaner sample where you can look at people and see what were the things in the past that may be associated with the MPN and um, because you want to look at prior to the diagnosis you don't want people who've been given lots of drugs and all sorts of things after diagnosis so that's what mosaic is about it's UK wide and we tried to, again to get a good representation around the country and Ireland and hopefully still the Australians and people will come in on that. So these, I don't think it will give all the answers because we never get all the answers, but you may be able to see about which of these environmental occupational factors are maybe associated with the development of an MPN. And by the way, smoking is not a good thing. That always comes out. Yeah, definitely stop smoking. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, so, Joe, I'm going to come to you um, just finally. Just maybe there's a question from David about aspirin and clopidogrel. And then maybe I just want you to comment on, do you think um, there's going to be a cure? So do you see the question from David? Shall I read it? Yeah, I'll read Be it right Before there. experiencing a TIA, some years before ET, I had frequent migraine type auras. So that, this is actually quite common. Since then, I've been taking clopidogrel, which has suppressed the auras. Could clopidogrel be a suitable alternative to aspirin for patients with migraines? So I would say yes. So um, we do use clopidogrel in patients who can't take aspirin. So the data is out there on aspirin, um, but um, there are patients that really can't take aspirin. And certainly clopidogrel is used, um, it has a very similar effect on platelets. So um, certainly I think that as an alternative um, is, is quite valid. Um, so hopefully that wraps that one up. And then do I see a cure? I think that's I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and and I think, um, yeah, we are glass half full people, aren't we really here? So, you know, we, we work in MPNs and, and that's what we're driving towards. So I guess, yes, we have to say that. I think if you asked me um, sort of 10, 15 years ago, um, would I have ever imagined that we would be where we are now? Um, you know, it, it's we, we've moved on a pace in such a such a period of time that actually, yes, surely, 
um, a potential cure or certainly at least a functional cure. I, I don't know whether, you know, we'll ever be in a position where we'll stop these things from occurring, but I think we'll get better at sort of being able to detect faulty genes and potentially put them right. So hopefully, yes. Absolutely fantastic. Be that with vaccinations or gene editing or other. So on that note, Nona, I'm going to hand back to you. Fabulous. Can I have my slide, please, Claire? Yes. Thank you. Um, now, I'm not sure if any of you are aware, and I, perhaps a lot of you are, but September is Blood Cancer Awareness Day, uh, Awareness Month, sorry, and that's global. Um, and if you look at the website, there's lots of information about the fundraising we're doing for that. Um, and I would love it if you could, uh, in spite of all this sort of global downturn in all our finances, if you can find just a little bit to donate to our work at MPN Voice, it will be hugely appreciated. You can donate either through the Just Giving page or you can, um, if you've got any queries, you can contact Maz on info at mpnvoice.org.uk and then we have a QR code. I promise you every single penny counts. And um, it I can assure you as co-chairman, it will be put to extremely good choice. We've lots of exciting things that we want to fund in future, but do please check the website out. On behalf of MPN Voice, I would really like to say a huge thank you to everybody in our community for your ongoing support. Uh, you've no idea how much it means to us. We've evolved over the last, certainly three years, and it's lovely to have a big MPN family. Um, I'd like to make special mention to all of you here tonight, the clinicians who've so generously given free time to support this forum, not for giving Faye. I will never look at a steak and chips again with the same <laughs> without thinking of you, Faye. <laughs> I think that was just an inspiring talk. Um, I, there's a hidden person who's going to be highly embarrassed by me mentioning her uh, and her team. But we couldn't do these online forums without the support of Guys and St. Thomas's NH Trust Commercial Services Directorate. There are two people who do the AV, Drew and Matt, uh, but there's one person particularly, and you're gonna not be very pleased for me saying this, Danny, we couldn't do this without you. And um, the whole community are really, really grateful to you. And a little birdie tells me that very soon you are to be married. May we all from the community wish you a long and happy marriage and a wonderful day. And then I can just say to everybody, thank you. This has been a very, very informative evening and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We look forward to seeing you soon and stay well and keep safe.